From Microbe TV, this is Q&A with A and V. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello, Vincent. How are you today? I, I had a reasonably good day. And you? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a, a ringing endorsement, Amy. Yeah, well, you know. Not a ringing endorsement. Welcome, everyone. Uh, 238 folks are here tonight to uh, join in the chat about viruses with the people who study them. And those are called virologists. Right, Amy? I just move fluid from tube to tube. Many people are, are saying in the pre-chat that they loved your twiv on your work. It's good. It's an exciting topic. Let me Hopefully. say, uh, let me um, put something up here. Last week, someone said they wanted a mice lie, monkeys exaggerate t-shirt. All right, so here we go. I see it. Now, now, Amy, you should be able to see everything now. Yeah, I do. I see, I see it. It's much better. So I made two... Um, I made two um, shirts. I made this one, which is just font, My Sly and Monkeys Exaggerate. Nothing nothing special. But then there's this one, which someone made uh, many years ago. They made this uh, stick, this thing here. Let's zoom in some more. My Sly, Monkeys Exaggerate, and Ferrets Are Not People. And we have a mouse. We have a, um, a monkey. And in the background, <laughs> polio virus. Uh, and that was done because um, at the time we were going through the, the ferret H1, H5N1 one h transmission experiments. And so that was something we said on a show. So anyway, whoever wanted that and if anyone else wants them, cafepress.com slash twiv. You can get your uh, your your, your uh, T-shirts. And you can also get Amy. Remember the Amy ones, right, Amy? Yeah, I have one. Here. Right, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> then there's life as an asymptote. An asymptote. Right asymptote. Right, Amy. Right, Amy. We have a lot of right, Amy's. We have countering a miasma of anti-think. We got a lot of good stuff here. Get your twiv swag. Is that how you say it, Amy? Swag? Sure. All right. Uh, there are a few other things I wanted to say. Oh, Amy, did you see the CDC released a study, which is quite old, saying that alpha variant of concern is no more intrinsically transmissible than ancestral SARS-CoV-2. What's uh, your reaction? I'm underwhelmed. Isn't that what we said when it first came out, remember, and everyone was criticizing us? Oh, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Well, said, yeah, but there are other papers that came to the same conclusion. It's just, it's underwhelming that it took them 22 months to figure that out. Indeed. So I okay. wonder if some of the people will give back the uh, give back their money now because clearly they were wrong. Give back and their money. What do you mean? Track. What do you mean by that? Well, certain individuals got grants on these things. You should give them back. <laughs> it's only All fair. Right. Um. <laughs> Need, Frank needs to attend. Frank, by the way, our, our moderators tonight, Frank, Les, Steph, Vanity Nutrition, and Tom. Did I get everyone? I think so. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Frank wants to know, and Frank's one of our moderators, need to attend a week-long in-person conference. Haven't been in a large setting in almost two years. If I wear an N95 for the entire conference, what are my odds of being infected? Minuscule. And you're also va triple vaccinated, Frank. So even if you do get infected, you're not going to get very sick, if anything. So you're good. And you can get an N95. I, I, I have. No, no. You can yeah. just go to the CVS, according to my mother. And they have them for free. You're just white, right? I don't know. I didn't take any when she offered them to me because I don't need them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, nobody got your dress right. 
What dress? Your, your dress tonight, you know, the... Oh, the gray sweater. The, so this weekend sweaters is is offline already? Well, they didn't get it. Um, huh. By the way, uh, Amy, congratulations on your your TWIF paper. A lot of congratulations, yes. Yeah, it's good. It was very. It was a good episode. Um, yeah. Let me see if anyone. Twiv is one of the best places on the internet. <laughs> oh, oh, have you been baking any pastries? I think you have. You told me the other day you baked something, right? I'm making um, malamars and pinwheels. My mom likes malamars, so I'm perfect. I'm learning how to make marshmallows and stuff. Because you pipe the marshmallow on like some graham cracker cookie and then you dunk it all into dark chocolate ganache or something or other. I don't mm. like them, but so the problem is, is that like some of these things you can't find easily in the supermarket. So mm -hmm. we decided to test out how to make a marshmallow and some other crap. It's not crap, Amy. Okay. Well, some other cookies to make this cookie that we don't even like. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's for my mom. She'll be happy. Um, someone said here, you're not, you're not, you're more like cooking plaque assays, right? Yes. Yeah. Are you we always a doing plaque a plaque assay? We do at least two trays of plaque assays every day. Excellent. Um, all right. Someone asks here, how is the latent and, and first of all, the name is, spelled wrong okay r-a-c-a-n-i-e-l-l-o how is the latent and eclipse periods different and i just so happen to have a uh, lecture slide here let's see if i can get this to work there you go can see you see it. that amy yep so this is what we call a one-step growth curve right uh, because um the, the cells are all synchronized and infected at the same time. And so we're measuring uh, infectivity on the y-axis in hours here. You infect, you let the virus absorb, and then you add medium, and then you measure infectivity. And you can see there's a period where you can't see any increase in infectivity. That's the eclipse period. What's happened there is the genome has come out of the particle. And uh, in this case, this is adenovirus type 5. Uh, mRNAs are being made in proteins. And eventually, you put together new particles, you replicate the genome, and then at about 12 hours, you see an increase in infectivity. That's the eclipse period. The latent period is the time uh, that before you see release of the infectious virus out of the cell. So the eclipse, these two curves here are measuring uh, virus in the cell. This one is virus in the medium. It takes a little extra time for the virus to get out, and that extra time is the latent period. So, straight from virology, fundamental virology, right, Amy? Straight from POV, the principles of virology textbook. Let's not get carried away here. Yeah, that book, that picture is actually from principles of virology. Shh, you bet. Okay, folks, so uh, sometimes we reach into the envelope. Um, oh, you have an envelope? I thought that was only for, like, foreseeing the future. I do have an envelope right here. It's kind of a big one, but I have it. I wonder what's okay. in it. Nothing um, good. Any thoughts? In, uh, fourth dose, eligible for booster. Fourth dose, immunocompromise. Any thoughts on this in light of the new data? BA2 is not neutralized by any of the monoclonals, including sotrovimab and Evusheld. I wouldn't worry about that. You're still now, now. You are immunocompromised, um, but the, the boosting is hitting T cells too, and that's what protects you against severe disease. I don't think you should worry about the antibodies. What do you think, Amy? No fourth dose. No fourth dose. Dose. Yeah, absolutely. Amy's twiv illustrated how science is done. That's precisely. I was hoping someone would get that besides us. Dixon got it. He loved it, and I, I hoped that people would say, yeah, this is how science is done. You illustrated it very beautifully, Amy. Thank you very much. It's good. Now, if it only came out in grant money, it would be even better. <sighs> Philip used to wake up Saturday to watch cartoons. Now it's TWIV. 
I'm sorry. Must in be a way. Daniel. Must yeah, be it's the Daniel. Daniel. I put I put these pods up to release at midnight, so you folks here in the uh, in the world can wake up and and watch them. You, whether you're in Europe or here in the U.S., uh, is it safe to say? Quote, antibody to all SARS-CoV-2, including future variants, will cross-react with all coronaviruses and vice versa. No. Why would there's, you very little cross uh, there's very cr little cross-reactivity. There's some, right? Yeah, there are some. That's why you're able to make a pan-corona vaccine, but it has to be a very specific epitope. And whether what how much protection that one epitope gives you when you have a thousand other epitopes that are specific to that virus is unclear, right? It's not exactly the same thing as when you give that solo epitope in a large bolus, right? Then you overcome it. It's low affinity or low avidity to get high, low affinity to get high avidity, right? Mm-hmm. Amy is the queen of cross-reactivity. That was all about her Friday twiv, right? Yes. Isn't that safe to say? Yeah. Uh, is it possible that the spike proteins from the mRNA vaccines may be common to any other viruses and thus people may have inherited immunity to other such viruses? No. It's, it's highly unlikely. It's even distinct from the four common cold human coronas, right? Yes. I need, Amy, do you know if you take, say, convalescent sera from someone who recovered from COVID, will it neutralize the four common cold coronas? Is there any cross reactivity? If you do the Amy experiment? Yeah, it will. Some shared epitopes, right? No, not necessarily. That's the Mesimus interpretation of the data. So if you had a previous SARS CoV 2, a SARS. COVID-2 infection and you had previous OC43 or 229E infections, if you're within that eight-year window, you have antibodies to OC43 and 229E circulating. So if you then did a plaque reduction assay looking, taking that polyclonal serum from that person and you ask, could you protect cells and culture from 229E and OC43? Mm. You could, but that doesn't say that those antibodies are the same antibodies that protect against SARS-CoV-2. You'd have to find the antibody. So that's a misinterpretation of the data. I just discovered a 10-year-old polio lecture you did at Columbia on YouTube. Question, since we don't survey wildlife, how do we know polio has no animal reservoir? In the old days, uh, they looked at lots of animals, although not extensive wildlife surveys. Um, however, the fact remains that susceptibility to polio is, is restricted to primates. If you try and f infect cells from any other species in the lab, the, the virus does not bind. And if you put the poliovirus receptor gene in those cells, like a mouse cell or a hamster or whatever, then they uh, will, you want to be the virus, then the virus will enter. I didn't say infect, Amy Rosenfeld. I said enter. You want to so, be careful because so, you don't want me to turn into Sabin and start yelling at you because Sabin would tell you you're not correct. Because LS, LC, LSC isolates do infect wild Yeah, types. certainly certain uh, viruses infect rodents. However, we don't know if they're infected in the wild. And so... Um, so that's, you don't want, you don't want to, you want to be more careful about what you said. Do you want to do some wildlife sampling, Amy? Yeah. Right, you know, we have... 50 trachea in the freezer, don't we? I know. And when I get a grant and I can hire a technician, I can write another grant to assay those tracheas. But at okay. this particular moment, when I'm going to be fired at the end of June, I don't think we're doing this. So you would say to Richard, there's no convincing evidence that there isn't a wildlife reservoir. So we have not, we have not, our, our experience is, is based off of animals that we've had in captivity, right? Sure. So like 
the guy the austrian guy with the with the blood types right he was lucky he had old world monkeys because new world monkeys you can in fact they don't get paralysis they don't replicate virus right <laughs> they don't they don't replicate they don't get paralysis that's right right um, and elephants you don't see with afm and stuff so from observational data and stuff we don't know that we don't know exactly what the animal reservoir was of polio because all human viruses come from animals at some point in time right yeah i mean you know so, Amy, that the that there are two conditions for eradication lifelong immunity and no animal reservoir right but it's hard to say there is no animal reservoir no one's found hard it, to but... say that there's lifelong immunity yes that too 40 years would you believe 40 years for a viremic virus yeah i would believe it but you know we might have mis we might have slightly miscalculated it's definitely over what we thought it over what other ones are like respiratory disease good find richard health. good find next week cdc is recommending to drop mask advisement thoughts amy ah uh, yeah well we shall see how it goes in the states that have already done it many states already have right right so new york new jersey connecticut california they've all dropped it columbia is even dropping it in the end of march it's not clear if they will drop it but i know the yeah, email said they say That's through march 31st through march 31st right so we got an email from Columbia today saying the New York State dropping of masks does not apply to Columbia. Until after March 31st. <laughs> I have a feeling they're going to change their minds. It's all about liability. Amy and I have been saying for weeks now, fully vaccinated people drop the masks. Problem is, is that people all then scream like you need to protect the, un the unvaccinated, right? But the unvaccinated are the people who, like, say you didn't need to shut down the economy to begin with. So a student asked me today, Amy, do you think we will have to be masked at commencement? According to Edmund, no, because it's outside. A lot of people close together, a lot of parents, many of whom won't be vaccinated. No, they're, do they're doing three years of commencement all at once, and they have some kind of organizational setup for each year individually. Oh, my gosh. And stuff. I, I don't really know. I, I said to Edmund, did he want me to go? He said he'd think. He'd get back. He'd think. When, when well, people actually, have to he think. didn't say he'd think. He just said. He get back to me. It's kind of like Edmund. Where's the surf poster, and what are we supposed to do? Oh well, you know, I'll have to get back to you when I get more instructions. Are, are zero to five year olds getting vaccinated yet? Technically, no. What people do, and if they lie, I have no idea. I don't want to know. Is there any way to speculate when our little ones might have a measure of protection through vaccination? So the idea is that Pfizer pulled back because they're waiting to include the data from the third dose. In what age group? This age group? Five to yeah, the five to zeros. Is that five to two? No, it's five. To, it's zero to five. All right, Amy. How far are we from, I guess, enterovirus vaccines? Right. Well, we got a polio vaccine. <laughs> and we have, in theory, in theory, we have a not so useful Entro 71 vaccine. Doesn't really protect you. Um, but uh, outside of that, I don't know. Um, do we, should we count Anne and her rhinovirus vaccines? So if you heard Amy last week, she said we don't need. We're never going to make a, We're never going to make an enterovirus an. We're never going to make a solo enterovirus vaccine again. So in other words, we're not going to have an enterovirus D68 vaccine. No. What are we going to have? Going to have a, a pan a pan entero countermeasure. Which you're going to invent, right? 
Invent? I don't like the word invent, but I know yeah. that's why I said it on purpose. I purposefully <laughs> said it to. I don't like the word invent. I don't Get under invent your skin. Anything. <laughs> I don't invent anything. That's what you're going to develop, correct? I, I, yeah, that's what I'm going to develop. Right. I don't invent anything. All right, so there you go. They're not going to be any more, Philip. Amy, what was the worst thing that ever happened in your lab? In my lab, what's the worst thing? Uh, when the students started screaming at me and telling me that I was a selfish, overambitious individual that would sacrifice and throw anybody, including my mother, under the bus for me to get ahead. It's like, okay, time for you to go. Yeah, that, I remember that. You told me that. Yeah. So she's gone, yeah, right? She she's... was a well, she was a student she who volunteered from the class and then she got all mad because she didn't do very well in the class. Mm -hmm. I think the worst experience I had was I had put a student to I think a uh oh I had put a postdoc from Mexico on a project to make a transgenic mouse poliovirus receptor transgenic mass lacking the cytoplasmic domain with the idea being that it wouldn't do exonal transport because you need the cytoplasmic domain. According to Eckhart's theory, uh, the cytoplasmic domain interacts with motor proteins. Well, the RNA and, doesn't. No, the cytoplasmic tail of the, of the yeah, I know, poliovirus receptor. Yeah, I know, there's no motor protein for RNA. You have to go through some kind of pr uh, Well, his theory was that the virus went up the exon in a vesicle is a virus particle. Okay. Anyway, um, I gave him the wrong construct and he spent months making the wrong thing and then he had to go back to Mexico with nothing. I felt really badly about that. That's not good. And Amy's quiet. Well, I was here for that. that I, remember, I remember him. I remember the project. I remember him watching television in the lab on his little portable television and stuff. He was a very nice guy, not the smartest. Let me just but... say something, folks. Amy does not like it if you watch TV. <laughs> in, the, in the lab, you're supposed to do experiments or read or talk to people. No TV. <laughs> I mean, I li uh, you know, I listen to podcasts, but I'm by myself most of the time. Yeah, no, no watching TV. SARS Gribbler says SARS-CoV-2 pre-existing immune reactivity exists to some degree in the general population. It is hypothesized that this might be due to immunity to common cold coronas. So what he's talking about is the cross, the T cell cross reactivity that Crotty and Sete reported a couple of years ago. Remember? Yeah, I remember. It was yeah, not very extensive. Or it's expansive. not extensive, and, and it's not known the contribution at all, but the press made a big deal out of it. They said, oh, you're going to be protected yeah, by Yeah, I know, it. and so is he. Absolutely no reason to, to think it's of any consequence. Do you have a cream-colored cashmere? No, that's not cream-colored. Is that cashmere what you're wearing? Yeah. Everything is cashmere. Is it's it gray. cream colored? It's gray. It's heather gray. It's light gray. This is not a lavender button down, but it is a button down. Button down is easy. You know I don't wear anything else. A&V really loved listening to Amy explain her latest paper on Twitter. Could we please have a quick two-minute or so summary? Okay, go for it, Amy. Uh... <laughs> Antibodies against one entero can block can protect cells in culture from infection by another entero, whether or not it's within a polyclonal sera or it's a site specific monoclonal antibody. Yeah. And the, the implications? Uh, the implications are sero surveys are not particularly helpful in understanding previous infections that people may have had. Cuddy Sark says, I thought immunity from vaccines has lower variance than natural infection because of precise dosing, et cetera. But did Amy say real source of variance is in the immune system itself? Can you elaborate? I don't know what variance he's referring to. Variation among, you know, person to person variation. 
has to do with genetics. Doesn't necessarily have to do with immune immune systems. It has to do with genetics of people. But you you claim and you not claim, claim. Is not the right word not the right word but you say and I think you're right that there's variation in oh, response. Oh re- wait a minute wait 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 a minute when I first proposed when I first corrected Cromer and Paul B- and Paul and Theodora I was like you don't know what you're talking about but now I'm correct. I, I, I'm going to need a drink. Send one. Go ahead, go, go ahead. There's nothing there. There's nothing in the office. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Actually, yeah, I know. Just send wine. <laughs> um, so, so you said so, the variation in re, to responses to vaccines and infections is the same because the genetics of immunology is the same, right? Exactly. So that's I agree with that. I think there's no, no reason to invoke variation in one versus the other. They they will both right. have variation. Right. Can you comment on the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, reporting on booster efficacy waning? I'm open to possible need for more shots, but to say a test negative CC meant general vaccine efficiency loss is fear-mongering. It's fear-mongering for sure. It's not waning. It's contracting, which antibodies do within six months. It's normal. We know, and now the key is, are you going to be protected? Yes, you're going to be protected against severe disease and death and hospitalization just like you were at two months. So the the media does not understand immune systems. They don't understand that antibodies and T-cells always contract, and you depend on a memory response. So you're going to get infected. You will be infected no matter how many times you've been vaccinated at six months after that vaccine, and your your memory response is going to save you. End of story. I don't think Amy will disagree with that. No. Amy, is there increased risk of getting shingles after a COVID booster? Yes, according to Daniel. Uh, yeah, they you're see right. see reactivation of, of Zoster. Yep. He's seeing it. He said he is seeing it. Yes. Uh, but uh, research, I'm not sure there's any research on it. I think it's just uh, observational epidemiology. Yeah. Uh, can you explain why duration of vaccine induced immunity varies so much between viruses? Does it generally have more to do with the characteristics of the virus or the vaccine or both? This is another one of Amy's favorites. All immunity, it's not just vaccine immunity, it's infection immunity that varies between viruses. We don't understand why immunity against rhino 1A is only for 14 weeks, whereas rhino C is like 18 months. We don't have any idea. It's a very hard thing to investigate, I would imagine. But um, Amy does have a theory that viruses that have a viremia make more long-lasting immunity than, say, mucosal viruses that do not enter the blood. Yes, okay. I do have that theory, and then it has been repeated and, and hijacked by John Udell. Yes. No, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. What divine intervention occurred there? Took him 45 mm-hmm. years. Anyway, the mechanism is not known, but that's the observation. The, the viremic viruses, smallpox, polio, measles, etc., really long-lasting immunity, but the respiratory viruses, shorter. And we don't know why. We may have to work, mix it up a bit and guess what shoes Amy is wearing. No, that's not going to be fun because in the lab it's always sneakers. Right? Yes, yes, because expensive Manolos do not come to the lab. You have, you, have to wear, you have to wear clothes to his shoes so just in case you, you know, you spill acid or the autoclave drips when you open the door and it's still hot. You don't sure. want to burn yourself. So like I have a friend from college who was wearing shorts and strappy sandals. And like the year, the summer between junior and senior year in college, I think she was at the University of Maryland doing some lab work or dishes in a lap. She went to go to med school. Um, and she opened the autoclave and water dripped down her legs. And now she has third degree burns in her ankle and stuff all from 
mid calf mm. down to her ankles and tops of her feet and it's like yeah she's not so it's it was really painful and dangerous and it's not not worth not worth it yeah and distilled vinegar kills certain viruses acetic acid yep not them yeah, I guess so. I guess it would be considered lower than a pH of 6.5. So I guess it could, mm. it could disrupt the rhinovirus. How about polio? No. How about Entero 68? Depends on what isolate. How about SARS-CoV-2? Yes. Strips yeah. off the fat, strips off the membrane. So it's the pH. Because I don't think, I don't think, I don't think acetic acid, I don't think either distilled or glacial will be under six. And, and it's really at like 5.8 that EV6E is like completely inactivated. Okay. How about having a cocktail of Omicron and wild type mRNA shot for the first time vaccine receivers? Why do you need Omicron? Don't I agree? You don't need Omicron. So I believe that there was a paper published, and then it was highlighted on the cover of Nature that told you that an Omicron-specific vaccine was a was not particularly effective. I sent you and Dan. Yeah, I do. I remember that. Yes. Yep. I don't absolutely. Know, what was it like Monday or something? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Hello from Pennsylvania. Our ventilator load is much lower than in months. Excellent. Great. Good to hear. What are the biggest things we've learned about virology during this pandemic? I mean, non-virologists are virology, virologists. I think they I are. As I, I just did. said, there are a ton of untrained virologists who are parading around as virologists. I'm unfortunately might be related to a few of them. <laughs> what about something scientific, okay, not sociological? <laughs> Can you say like one important thing that we have learned from the pandemic? You can make a vaccine vaccine out of mRNA, sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, that's I the think... only thing. Everything else is as a recapitulation of a fundamental principle under the title of SARS-CoV-2. But don't you think, and now I know you're going to disagree with me, so I'm going to preface this to to, uh, oh, buffer, you, bu to buffer your ire. Don't you think the discovery of antigenic variation in coronaviruses is important? It is important, but I don't know why I would have assumed that coronaviruses didn't undergo antigenic variation. Do you know any? Name something that doesn't go under antigenic variation. Hey, folks, watch this. Enteroviruses. Now, <laughs> so I mean, you know that that that's not true because uh, not only from me, but from Kara Burns and others, right? You know that. So yeah, yeah, like yeah of Kara, course, right? So Kara did that whole survey where they sequenced and they saw that what was it? Site one, and they characterized site one, or was it two and three? Maybe two and three was already known from the Finland outbreak in in, in 1984, but Kara mm. has shown that the that the BC loop or site one undergoes anagenic drift until you can't find the receptor anymore, and then it doesn't do anything because the virus doesn't infect you. So it's not a specifically smart strategy. Uh, what's the COVID mortality rate versus flu? Can't ask no, that idea. question. Can't ask that question. It depends. Each one is different. It depends on which isolate of influenza, H3N2, H1N1. Um, you just cannot know because mortality is influenced not just by the virus, but by the kind of care that people get. Look at the mortality in different countries with COVID. I mean, it's all over the place. So it's not something you can compare. People will, on the pundits, on the TV shows, will compare, but they're wrong to do so. Wow, somebody says that the pH of distilled white vinegar is 2.5. I don't think it's on par with, I had no idea that acetic acid was on par with hydrochloric acid. That doesn't seem right. Can you go into the lab and measure the pH of some of your um, 
glacial acetic acid. I'm yeah, just when kidding. I, have a, I was going to say in my spare time at 2 a.m., sure. I'm kidding. No I'm need just to kidding. sleep. I'm kidding. No thank need you. to go to sleep. Buzz, thank you for your contribution. Incubation request for a Cracker Jack mycologist to be elevated to the Twee team. Help bring the fungus among us. I know Buzz Earwave always wants this week in fungus. Maybe one day. You know, these, these things have to incubate. We have to find the right people. Yeah, I know. But the funny thing is, is I used to call someone a fungus among us. That's not me, is it? No, it's my friend Howie. No, he's Howie, right. It, Howie, it, right. Uh, he's right. Approximately a one molar solution of acetic acid is about 2.5. Wow. Huh? No idea. Um, no, Howie, when I first started as a technician, I saw him every day on my first day of work, on my first week of work at Sinai. Every day he was like, what looked like the same suit carrying the same overstuffed suitcase dragging it around and then he finally came to our lab on friday afternoon at like 4 30 he was completely disheveled hair was a mess glasses were cockeyed things were out of the suitcase all over the place and i had seen him like the day before at palaises and i was like what are you a fungus among us you never leave What's your opinion of MMWR studies showing vaccine effectiveness for hospitalization decreased from 91% at two months post booster to 78% four months? I discussed this with Daniel some time ago. I think these hospitalization metrics are very difficult. You have to be careful because as, as Daniel said, sometimes people are hospitalized for something else. And if they test positive, it goes down as a COVID hospitalization. And, you know, hospitalization metrics may be different in different places. So I'd rather see the severity of the disease and the, the outcome, whether there's death or not. And that's so I'm very suspicious of this. Would you share didn't that Marcola, suspicion? Yeah, but didn't Marcola from the, from the VRC support that? Yes, Marcola did support that, right? He agreed. Any thoughts on the most recent first cured HIV patient? Did you see this in the news, Amy? Did they do it the same way? Yeah, it's the first woman to be cured, basically. The other two were guys, so. Oh, okay. That's, well, it's good. Sure. I didn't realize that a vaccine didn't work. I didn't realize. I'm not so into, oh my God, this is a woman versus a man. Not really that interested. You think viruses used to be cells but lost cytoplasm? No. 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 Viruses were before cells. Do you, do you believe that, Amy? Do you subscribe to that theory? The RNA viruses were before cells for sure. Yeah. I think the RNA viruses are the steps are the evolutionary step into becoming a cell. Loved Amy's paper presentation. So you have fans. It's good. It's almost 9.10, so like at 9.15 I have to go because I have to melt my overlay. My plates have been sitting there for a while. Here's another Amy praise. After listening to TWIV 866, I'm surprised you would even listen for a second to those who kvetch at you from time to time with their folklore science. You're an amazing scientist. What does kvetch Thank mean, you. Amy? Complain, whine. Is that is that, the Yidd is that Yiddish? Yes. Kvetch. What a good word. <laughs> How cr Here's another one for Amy. How cross-reactive are Omicron antibodies to other variants? Well, they're somewhat cross-reactive, depending on what neutralization assay you're doing and who's doing them. Some people report zero. Some people report 5%. Some people report 20%. No standard. Yeah, no idea. Oh, every... Everybody has good questions. I like this very much. How many other novel viruses are out there that we just don't know about yet because they don't cause disease in humans? Well, did you see, I sent you Eddie Holmes' paper about the game animals yeah. in China. I mean, it's amazing. And he only did like, what, 30 species or something? Yeah, let me, let me bring it. Did you send it to me and Daniel or just me? No, just you. Here we go. I didn't think it would inter interest Daniel. It's Here not it really is. clinically relevant. Yeah. 
Uh, let me bring it up here. Virome characterization of game animals in China. It reveals a spectrum of emerging pathogens. So 1,941 game animals from five mammalian orders. 102 mammalian infecting viruses discovered 21 posing a potential risk to humans. Civets carried a relatively higher number of potentially high-risk viruses, also identified in game animals. Do you think we? Sh I think we should do this on TWIF, don't you? For sure. I mean, there's some there. There's a few enteros, a lot of kabuki and achi viruses, but there are some enteros, and there are like he has one figure that shows you the phylogenetic tree of hepatitis A and where humans are, where the human. Uh, viruses on it compared to the others. It's really good. Good paper. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Uh, thank you, John, for your contribution to the incubator. Jack says, is there any evidence in any species that antibodies against proteins other than spike are protective against SARS-CoV-2 infection? We know we've assayed antibodies from other species. I mean, other than what humans? Yeah. Anyway, I, like I, I don't, don't think know we assayed I... any antibodies from the minks. I don't think we have an antibody profile from the minks, mm. or from the or from the deer. I think we can just say that they're infected because they are antigen positive, but that's just a viral protein that's not spike. Yeah. I don't think we actually. Yeah, I don't think we know anything. So, how would you? hypothesize if i gave you an antibody against nucleocapsid protein i made it in mice and i said try a neutralization assay do you think it would neutralize not in not in a traditional plaque assay but i bet you if we immunize the mouse with it it would yeah i agree sometimes we agree yeah so i spoke to someone earlier who said <laughs> I like how you and Vincent have these friendly disagreements. And it was like, I was like, you have to understand, we've been together for like 100 years and we know so many people. It's like nothing more than like a joke at this point where I just come out and say, well, you're wrong. <laughs> yes, like, it is a joke, but Amy doesn't know how deeply it hurts inside. <laughs> Let's not let's not bring out the drama queen. No need for the drama queen, and no so time I, for the drama queen. I didn't know swag is bad weed. So swag is the cool stuff. Yeah, you're right. I said swag. I didn't know. Did you know swag was bad weed? Wow, I've learned a word tonight. Thank you, Catalina, Caroline. Sorry, sorry. Jen has it up on the 75 inch TV. Can you imagine, Amy? You're on the 75 inch TV. Nobody needs to be that big. I could actually make you full screen right now, but I'm afraid that I wouldn't be able to get back if I, if I did that. Yeah, that wouldn't be... Uh, we don't need to test it out. That's What's the proper idea. metric for SARS-CoV-2 infections that do not progress to COVID? The closest I have found is asymptomatic disease, but isn't that an oxymoron? <laughs> it is an oxymoron. Yes. There's all kinds of words, right? There is pre-symptomatic where you I don't, don't have anything, but before you get symptoms. But pre implies that you're going to get symptoms. So you can't be pre-symptomatic because you have no idea. Right. And then there's posse symptomatic. Do you know what, have you heard that one? So you have minimal symptoms? Yes. Because posse symptoms. is like minimal. So but the proper metric though, so golf, the proper metric is being infected, confirmed by antigen or PCR best and then you don't develop symptoms and then the PC, you become PCR negative. So you've gone through an infection course and you have no symptoms. I yeah, I agree. PCR that. is just a surrogate for infection. I wouldn't, I, yeah, I'd course. be very it's, careful. It's what we do, but I agree that we'd rather measure infectious virus, but it's a surrogate. Yeah. SP Third Eye is wearing their Twiv T. Cool. I think that's great. You watch a, a Q and A, and you wear a Twiv T shirt. All right. Okay. So this is all right. This two is, more questions because I have to do my plaque assays, and then I have to go home and eat dinner. Mike says this. Carl Gerhard Gottfried discovered that monthly injections of a Staph aureus vaccine can treat chronic fatigue syndrome. Could something similar have benefit for long haul COVID? I don't know anything about it. Never heard that. 
you know, it's a kind of thing that sounds suspicious, right? And yeah, it's staff. a kind of thing that I'm sure your blog co-writer would spend like 15 pages refuting for the next 25 <laughs> years. Amy thinks that Dave has writes too long. His diary <laughs> typewriter. Um, but Staph aureus has a super antigen, and maybe that's part of it, Amy. Anyway, we don't know, Mike. It's... I think it's very early days on the on the CFS stuff, as well. I'm not ven I'm not willing to venture a guess. My my 13 year old wants to get a booster. It's been six months since his last shot. It well, depends. they're advocating it, so it's fine. Yeah, I mean, you can do it. it, it but don't you think, Amy, if the first two doses were were spaced properly, you don't need a booster? But they probably weren't, right? Most likely they weren't. I agree with Offit that it's probably unnecessary, but I also bet you that eventually this will be licensed. This will be like when you go to school and they say, have you had your tetanus booster? Did you get your COVID booster? Yeah. So, and I believe, I, I mean, I was thrown out of school for a day because we, I didn't have a tetanus booster. They looked at my records. They said, Amy Rosenfeld, come to the nurse's office. Then I had to call my mom. I had to go home. We had to rapidly go to the pediatrician and try and get a tetanus booster. It's quite funny. Can we do two more? Okay. Amy, antibody-dependent enhancement of SARS-CoV-2 infection is mediated by the IgG receptors, FC gamma, but does not contribute to aberrant cytokine production by macrophages. This must be some in vitro artifactual system, right? Yes. Where they show that the virus can get into cells via FC receptors. And so the yes. idea here was maybe it makes macrophages. This actually may have been done by Tia. Oh, Tia from Peter Palazzi? Yeah, the one in Stanford. Yeah, I know. But the point here yeah. is that it doesn't contribute to aberrant cytokine production, which would be... So like, I don't know why it's called antibody-dependent enhancement of yeah. infection. I know, I mean, I guess it's enhancement of infection versus enhanced disease. So that might be correct. Yeah. But I, right. I think that it was done in collaboration with Tia. Can you get long COVID after an asymptomatic infection? Yes. Okay. You want to do one more? Sure, and then I have to go. All right, so this is a comment. My mom is headed back to China tomorrow and thanks you for all the advice we have gotten from you. You're welcome. And this one, I had MECFS for over a decade and asthma since I can remember. I'm triple jabbed in my 20s. Do you think I should be safe to return to normal life? Talk to Daniel or Ian. Why is that? I'm not an MD, so I have no idea like anything about how the M the ME CSF and the vaccines are interrelated and stuff. And I have no idea if that ME CSF like can exacerbate or inhibit, you know, and you know, effective immunity induced by the vaccine. And Ian is very into MCSF research and Daniel sees patients. So why would I venture a guess on this? I'll ask him tomorrow if uh, any CFS patients have uh, any issues if, if they're vaccinated and so forth. I, I mean, if I was going to say, if it, I mean, if it falls along the same lines as long haul COVID people, they think that the vaccine helps them re resolve the whatever is calling causing the long-term COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. So it would be beneficial. But I'm not willing, I don't know enough about it. I'm not willing to take a stake on it. And I think that those two people have the most knowledge about MCSF. Yeah. All right, last one. My school has 95% vaccination rate. So we remove the mask mandate. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we've been saying that for a while. I think Columbia should remove it, but they're not. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Amy. I think I didn't need to go for a random test yesterday. Oh, for sure you didn't. 
Yeah. Of so here, a- here's the so here's the great story about this. Oliver loved this story too. So they they call they they send you the email. They say, okay, schedule your random test. You've been selected. Like triple vaccinated. What are you testing? Okay. So you get there. <laughs> And the lady in front of you says to the person who's going to hand you the nasal pharyngeal swab. So how long is it going to take for me to get the results? They're like, oh, 72 hours. I was like, 72 hours. This is longer than when it was in the heat of the outbreak. You have less patience to test. Why is it taking so long? Okay, so whatever. So today at like four o'clock, I get the email that says the test results are available at the Broad website and I should follow this link. But you go in, you put in your email, and then it says, what's your password? So I thought it was like my uni password. Nope, doesn't work. <laughs> then, you, <laughs> so, then you try your email password. Nope, doesn't work. You try your uni password one more time. Nope, doesn't work. So then you go through the trash can of your email because <laughs> you threw out the instructions. And it says to you, oh, they're going to send you an email for you to register so you can self-manage your your portal do you get any email about registering so you can self-manage this portal no <laughs> so i guess tomorrow when i go to my do my self attestation if it turns red i'll know that there was some problem with the test and then at 6 a.m i'll be really pissed off good ex- is, good good experience <laughs> this is genius Thank you, Amy. All right. I'll talk to you tomorrow when I figure out if I was positive or negative. You're not positive. Good night. Well, of course I'm not positive, but you know. But this is obviously the most efficient way of reporting results here at the Columbia. Do you not think? Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Do you not see the humor in it? Yeah, of course I do. I do, I do see the humor. It is. All right. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Good night. Thank you, Amy. Bye. Okay. That's not what we want now. No. Okay. Sundari lives in an ashram in India. We all got Omicron B2. Any idea about getting reinfection in the future? We are triple vaxxed AstraZeneca. You will get reinfected every year probably, no matter how many vaccinations you have had. Unless... So for the first six months after you get a boost, you are protected against infection, and then that contra- the antibody levels contract, and you get infected, but you don't get very sick. You might get sniffles. You wouldn't even know it. So you'll get infected, yeah. The virus is here to stay in the human population, and it's going to infect many, many people every year reliably. Um that one I'm going to answer, but it's not the one I clicked on. My school has a 95% vaccination rate. Should we remove the mask? I think Amy said yes. Yes. Remove the mask mandate. Okay. This is a little con- contentious. What is more accurate, reliable, epidemiological studies or lab studies? Well, they're different, right? They do different things, and one does not substitute for the other. The epidemiologists, I don't want to trash epidemiologists, but I do want to just raise a little criticism. They think they can find out the properties of a virus by observing its movement in a population. And that only works to a certain extent. So epidemiologists study the movement of, say, infectious diseases in a population. That, that's not all they do. They other things as well. But that's what we're talking about tonight. They can predict you know, sizes of outbreaks and so forth. They can predict. They can try and determine where an, an outbreak began. They can do contact tracing, and so forth. But they cannot tell you fundamental properties of the virus. That you get from laboratory studies. And I don't care how insistent the epidemiologist is, they can't do that. Likewise, a virologist in a lab can't tell you how many people are going to be infected. That's the epidemiologist purvey. So they have different expertises and strength. And the problem in every outbreak is that Borders become blurred, right? And epidemiologists think they're virologists and vice versa. So that's that's where it goes. So one, it's not really fair to say is one more accurate because they're very different. Uh, After 
A virus particle successfully invades a cell. How many virus copies does it make before the cell is destroyed? A thousands, tens of thousands of new viruses are made per cell. Right? And they're, they're all different because they have all sustained different mutations. The virion is the name for the infectious virus particle. So uh, let's see. Here we go. Here we have a purple infectious virus particle. It happens to be it happens to be a holiday tree ornament <laughs> someone gave me, which is a polio virus with a little TWIV logo. But it is um, – I'm trying to get it in focus here. This is a virus particle. If it's infectious, it's a virion. Not all virus particles are infectious because some of them are broken or mutated or whatever, right? Just the, just the way the viruses work. They make lots of offspring – and this, many of them are broken, but there's so many that there's still a good chance they're going to infect the cell. So a virion is the infectious virus particle, uh, and virus particle can be f infectious or not. Okay, there you go. A friend who's suffering badly with cluster headaches post-COVID, what help is there for people? She's been told she could have them for years, and there's no help. Well, um, so yes, th this is a common response which is unacceptable that there's no there's no help he, here for example in new york there is a long covid clinic at mount sinai where you can you know, in the uk it doesn't help you but you have to find sympathetic people who are willing to spend the time to try and help um, there's not always a solution but there may be instead of saying we can't do anything so try and find place like that, a clinic that specializes that and is willing to help you. And as I said, there, we have one in New York, which is very good. I've heard from long-haul patients who like it very much. They help them. Bill Gates said on a pod this week, mRNA vaccine will completely cure all coronas and the flu in the future. Well, first of all, that's wrong to say. It's not going to cure anything. Just like Amy's not going to invent anything. It's not going to cure anything. What it will do, the vaccine will prevent severe disease and death, right? And so um, that's what it's going to do. And maybe influenza. Who knows? It's, it's being tested. We don't know if it will work for influenza. <clears throat> what, is, what about mRNA makes this possible? Well, the, it's, and I should just say the mRNA vaccines are great, but they can be improved upon. We did a paper today on TWIV, which will drop at midnight. you got to listen to this. They made a three-component vaccine, an adenovirus vectored vaccine with spike, nucleocapsid, and RNA polymerase. And they put it intranasally. One dose gives B and T cell immunity with memory that protects against multiple variants. It's very impressive. Now, this is in mice. It's going, to be, it's going into people now. But you could make that with mRNA three mRNAs. Why mRNA is cool is because it it's really translated. Very, you make a lot of antigen, when a lot of protein when the mRNA gets into a cell. For a short period of time, you make a burst of protein, and that apparently is really good, and that was unexpected. And of course, you can make it very quickly. You just have to make the RNA to whatever sequence you want and test it and so forth. And it, it's it's just a brilliant technology, yeah. <clears throat> asymptomatic means no noticeable symptoms well look a symptom is what you feel you can say I have a headache I have a stomach ache muscle ache, fatigue, whatever I can't hear, I have ringing in my ears that's what a symptom is so it is noticeable to you, but not to someone else. Now, asymptomatic means you don't feel anything. The problem is that people's barrier for feeling is different, right? For some people, a headache disables them, and for others, they don't even feel a headache when they have one. So this is this kind of a subjective thing here. It take, I, I, let me take your symptoms for to a certain extent. So I don't know what you mean by no noticeable versus absence. If you don't, either you feel it or you don't. If Amy had been my neighbor, I might not have lost 40 pounds. My cooking sure hasn't improved. <laughs> yeah. 
to everyone asking, yes, you can get long COVID. Yeah. Yes, if you're vaxxed, especially boosted, uh, the long COVID is, is, is severely decreased, substantially decreased. Yeah, um, which is good. How many virions of SARS-CoV-2 are typically required to infect? No, so we don't know typically, Mark. There's no typical. The only thing we know is the challenge study where they infected people with, uh, what was it? They, they used uh, TCID-50s. I think 55 TCID-50s, which was 5 PFU. And that infected half of the people. But this is not even accurate because... They pipetted the virus into their nose with their head back, right? They had to keep their head back for five minutes. And then they clamped their nares shut for a while afterwards to make sure the inoculum stayed in there. Don't tell me that's how we get infected. So that's the number is to be treated with suspicion. I'm sure in people it's much higher because the efficiency of infection is much less. So we don't know, but Mark, and don't let anyone tell you they know they're wrong. That's what a virologist does, not an epidemiologist. I have one Moderna shot caught COVID three months later. Are you sure? If you're sure you got COVID, then you don't need a second shot. No. One shot and recovered from infection is great. Will RNA viruses in cell culture mutate in subsequent passages? Yes, they do. It always. So you, you don't want to passage viruses to make stocks. You want to have a stock, you take it, you make a working stock. When that runs out, you go back to the original and make another. You don't keep passing it from from experiment to experiment because that will introduce changes and drift and it's not good. Is it possible to maintain a reference culture? Yes. So that's what we do. We make a stock, which is your reference culture. And ideally, you make the stock from a DNA copy of whose sequence you know and that way you can ensure that you have minimal changes. You're never going to have zero changes because the viruses mutate every reproduction cycle. Is there a report here in Sweden that claims monoclonals don't work as well with BA2? How can this be true? Don't they make it from the variants antibodies? No, they, the, the antibodies were made some time ago, right, against ancestral uh, viruses. So... They're not making new ones, and that's the problem. The variants change, and they can evade some of these monoclonals. And so that's a problem because for people that need treatment with monoclonals because they don't respond to vaccines, for example, or they haven't been vaccinated, that's a real problem. should do a Q&A on retroviruses. Well, then we would have to get a retrovirus person because my, you know, my retrovirus knowledge is uh, better than most people's, but uh, it is not, uh, it's not terribly deep. You know, I know enough to teach and uh, answer questions, but we'd have to get some experts for a Q&A. It was recommended to let used N95 sit for seven days before reuse to let potential filtered virus time to deactivate. Yes. Yeah, of course, the, the, the masks are filtering the droplets, not the virus particles, but the virus particles within droplets, and they're in the mask. Yeah, so you, it's a good idea to do that for sure. My daughter's school recently mandated vaccination for all kids five and up for the upcoming year. In your opinion, is the most compelling argument as to why a school should mandate the COVID vaccine? What is the most compelling argument? To, to prevent them from dying, to prevent them from getting severe COVID and long haul COVID, which happens, right? There have been a lot of kids in that age group getting sick lately especially since August, as Daniel Griffin says, and many of them from Omicron, which is not only cold. Daniel Griffin says it is not mild. Don't tell the people who have died of it that it's mild. So that's why you want to vaccinate kids, because if it's your kid and he or she dies of COVID or becomes 
disabled with long haul? How are you going to feel if you didn't vaccinate them? Are you willing to take that choice? I'm not. Is the incubator active while remote live streams are running? What do, what do you mean active? I mean, the lights are shut off and all the equipment is shut down. Yeah, yeah, it's closed. Uh, I, I left tonight. Well, I left to teach my class at 3.15, right? And so I closed. I shut down the computers. I shut down the audio equipment and everything. Turned the heat off in one room because it's on in the other room. It gets too hot. Turned the lights off. Locked the door. There you go. Did you ever hear the poem by uh, John Updike? Let me let me uh, let me let me recite it to you. Please give me this um, indulgence here because I I just reminded myself lock the door and you'll see why in a moment. And this is the. Um, the poem, which I think is absolutely brilliant, and I hope you agree with me, so let me read it for you. V.B. Wigglesworth wakes at noon, washes, shaves, and very soon is at the lab. He reads his mail, swings a tadpole by the tail, undoes his coat, removes his hat, dips a spider in a vat of alkaline, phones the press, tells him he is F.R.S., Subdivides six protocells, kills a rat by ringing bells, writes a treatise, edits two symposia on will man do, gives a lecture, audits three, has the sperm club in for tea, pensions off an aging spore, cracks a test tube, takes some pure science and applies it, finds his hat, adjusts it, pulls the blinds, instructs the jellyfish to spawn, and by one o'clock is gone. By John Updike. He wakes at noon and very soon is at the lab and by one o'clock he's gone after having done all this stuff. Isn't that great? Here, I like this part. You know, he, he pulls the blinds. It's like me locking the door of the incubator. Thank you for your indulgence. Uh, I love that poem. I used to have it on the wall of my office for years. Have any of you to published anything recently? Seriously? You didn't hear the Twiv Friday about the paper we just published? Yeah. Go listen. Yeah, we did. We um, published a paper in MBio on cross-reactive antibody responses among enteroviruses. Really good stuff by Amy. Which of your lectures got updated the most between the 2021 course and virology live lectures? Um, they all updated a certain amount because I put some SARS-CoV-2 specific material in, but I would say the um, the second half of the course on, on infections in hosts, so infection basics, antivirals and vaccines, uh, and uh, you know material on evolution and emergence all that probably got updated the most yeah presently there are programs to make kids interested in science that efforts of educators to make science interesting have an effect on your future present careers interest to a certain extent yes um I had, so first of all, my father was a doctor and I was interested in medicine for a while, which I thought was the same as science. And then, you know, I realized it wasn't later, but then I ended up, I didn't want to be a doctor. And that's partly how I found science. But I had a great biology teacher in high school. She was just fabulous. I had many good biology teachers in high school, but uh, Mrs. Doden was special and she made it so interesting for us that I was just, and I took advanced placement bio with her also so that i would say I, I owe a great deal to her to getting me excited about science do i still correspond with david baltimore he asked why do you think the ppra fear and cleavage site suggested non-natural origin well because david didn't understand that it's present in other coronaries he thought that it was only present in this one so 
He said, ah, it's there in this one and the others now, so it must have been put there. But that's flawed logic, right? Because just because something's there doesn't mean that a person put it there. And so you can find similar sites in other coronaviruses and even in bats. So there's no reason to think. And, and, and anyway, who would know to put it there? No one would know that it would have such an effect. Now, that's not saying that a reason that why it wasn't put there. The reason is that it evolved in nature and that happens with other coronaviruses, but no one would know that it would have such an effect on infectivity. Okay, so you can argue it was put there randomly, but no one had the virus to put it in. That's the problem. No one had this virus in any laboratory that they were manipulating. Should I get a third dose of J&J? &J? Depends how close the first two were. If they were four weeks apart, then yes. If they were six months apart, then no. And yes, Baltimore walked it back, although, as you know, it's too late. Because when a normal laureate says something, they don't want to hear it walked back. The press ignores it. What steps should be taken to prevent the next pandemic? Well, we should be making antivirals and vaccines that are pan-corona, right? Which is what we should have done before this one, which we fully were capable of doing. But now we have more knowledge. We have uh, the understanding that adenoviruses and mRNA are good vectors for vaccines. We now know that you need more than spike, most likely, this, these latest data. Uh, out of uh, McMaster University. Um, so, uh, and I think that that is happening. I don't know if it'll continue once the pandemic is over, but the other part of it is we need to do wildlife sampling. We need to know what's out there. We barely do it. And, and as we just showed from the Eddie Holmes study, there's so many viruses out there. <laughs> uh, where in New York has the best Zeppeli? I don't know. I haven't had Zeppeli in New York in a long time. Frank, do you know where the best Zeppeli is in New York? Is that a mechanical keyboard? Yeah, I love mechanical keyboards. I love clicky switches. So here's the one you heard, okay, um, which I designed. You know, you could see the colors. Um, it's by WASD Keyboards. Sorry about this. I, I can't really pull this. WASD keyboards. I have many mechanical keyboards. Let me just take a diversion here. So this is another one I recently built here, which has got the matcha color, right? It's also clicky. This is by Novel Keys. This is a really nice uh, small company, Novel Keys, with really substantial weight. And then... Uh, this is another one which I don't really like because it's missing uh, our up and down and sideways arrow keys, right? You know, it's a small, I think it's a 68, 66 key, right? It's also from a WASD, but Cherry MX. Uh, I'm not sure if they're blues or blacks or whatever, but um, I like them. And I have more at work, too. I love, my, and my son is equally crazy about keyboards. Thanks for... Uh, for asking, <laughs> I love clicky. Of course, I do have a quiet keyboard here, uh, which I use on the laptop that I have the stream running on. I really should have two of these so I don't make noise during the stream. It's not nice, I agree, but I don't have another one. Does the recent challenge study make it possible to estimate how much exposure is enough to cause an infection? No, I don't think so. As I just mentioned before, because the artificial way that the virus was put in the nose and held there, that's just totally not like it happens in real life. So I don't think we learn much about about contact and transmission and so forth. What I do think we, we learned about is, you know, kinetics of shedding. When when titers peak wear, they, they're higher in the nose than in the throat and so forth. Um and I think the next one is going to be vaccine versus un vaccinated versus unvaccinated and looking at infectious virus shedding uh, should be very interesting. Uh, 
All right, so the cure for HIV is is what we mentioned before, that uh, this is nothing new. Let's see. This is a woman, first woman. Oh, it's a novel treatment. So let's see what they got. As opposed to the other's got a bone marrow transplant using, not my favorite author of this article, but we'll bypass that, umbilical cord blood. Received cord blood from a matched donor. Uh, so I'm not seeing. Um, so the, yeah, this is the third case. The Berlin patient, Timothy Bray Brown, was the first one. And then Adam Castillejo also. So uh, this is the first woman. And they, the two others got a bone marrow transplant from people who have a mutation in the CCR5 gene, so they, the virus can't infect uh, the new cells. The woman, uh, let's see, what did she get? Cord blood. So she didn't get a bone marrow transplant, but it's not clear if the cord blood came from that, uh, that kind of donor. I don't have time to go through this here, but we'll have to check that out. What were the chances a new dominant variant will emerge soon? I don't like to talk about chances. It, it may happen because there's still a lot of uh, unvaccinated people who are susceptible. And, of course, the virus can reproduce even for a short time in people who are vaccinated. So I, I'm, I have a feeling we're going to see a series of variants sort of like what we have with influenza, but I don't know that they're going to be of consequence for severe disease. Thank you, Squoyster, for your contribution. You know, a number of years ago, we tried to crowdsource support for Amy's work. So Amy has historically had trouble getting NIH support. So she, you know, this this story of not being appreciated because you're too ahead of the curve. So um, you know, we only raised $15,000, which isn't enough to do very much. And so that's not a that's not an answer to the problem. Amy's story illustrates a bunch of things that are wrong with science funding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the latest Twiv Amy episode that everyone's referring to? Yes, it is. It's eight, eight sixty six. Yes, eight sixty six, and eight sixty seven will be dropping tonight. So that's that's different. As the graph you showed indicate, the latent period ends after the concentration of virus has already started to increase. Yeah, the latent period ends when the first vi infectious virus has come out of the cells. That's it. How long were my memory T and B cells from a natural infection actually last? Well, we don't know because we're only a few years out, right? But I would say um, at least five years, but not not longer. It's not going to go 10 years because respiratory mucosal infection immunity doesn't last that long. As we said earlier at the beginning, it just does for all viruses that hit the respiratory mucosa, the um, protection is, is transient. Thank you, OD, for your contributions. As academics and educators, don't you think there's value in dropping the droplet dogma and using the word airborne? Aerosolized nuclei are not the same as droplet in the general population. Well, I think they're all droplets, in my opinion. They're just different sizes. Air people use airborne to mean the smallest droplets, right? So that's kind of ensconced. So I'm not sure it would work. It would confuse people. So I just say droplet, respiratory droplet transmission. They're all respiratory droplets. That's how they originate. Yeah, Amy was freezing up tonight. I don't know why. She has great internet at Columbia. Um, 
and, and the computer is fine. It's Ethernet. I'm not sure. She, from time to time, freezes uh, elsewhere. I mean, I have. She's using my old setup there in my office. Uh, it's really a good setup. <sighs> Um, I don't know that I will check it out Friday and see if there, there are any loose connections and so forth. Uh, why is Amy being fired in June? So, um, well, so the, we don't have grant support past June. Um, the, our last big one that we put in, which was on this cross reactive antibody stuff, got ridiculous criticisms that are simply wrong. And so, um, we, we, we resubmitted it, we made a new grant actually, which could save her. But um, it's, you know, it's a very tight situation. But alternatively, maybe she'll get a job. That's another possibility, in which case she'll leave Columbia and maybe not be able to do these. I don't know. We'll see. And it's a shame because she's really brilliant and has been doing all this on her own, has great ideas and sees through things. And people who are far less um, capable do better, and it's not right. If, if SARS-CoV-2 can't be transmitted by fomites, why do people hear the message to wash their hands? Well, early on, and we, were, we weren't sure it wasn't transmitted by fomites, right? So that's why we said wash your hands, which isn't a big deal, right? And now we realize not much transmission by fomites. Nevertheless... Certainly other infections are transmitted by hands, and you can cut those down. So washing them isn't a bad idea. I'm confused about leaky gut, and that clinically is not recognized as a diagnosis but as a symptom. Was an MISC attributed to leaky gut? I'm not sure about the diagnosis versus a symptom, but it is a consequence of infl inflammatory response. The same thing happens with uh, with AIDS patients. They have um, inflammation. The gut wall breaks down. Um, it becomes leaky, and, and you have bacteria leaking into the circulation, causing uh, inflammation. I am waiting six months to get the second Pfizer dose. Will my reaction be any different than if I received second dose three weeks later? Your reaction. I'm not sure what you mean by reaction, but six months is a good spacing. Now you're going to have great immunity after those two doses, and you should not need a booster. That's what the data are saying. Uh, grants for research come to an end, uh, and with no funding, there's no job. Well, that's not entirely true, so... I, I'm not getting fired because I'm tenured, right? Um, I'm I, I, My job was originally a tenure-track position. I achieved tenure in the 90s, and they have to pay me a certain amount, not my full salary, but that's fine. But Amy is not on a tenure-track position, and that's the problem. So there's she's supported on our grants, and if the grants end, she has no support. But I... Um, if, when she leaves, either for another job or, unfortunately, hopefully not, uh, I won't stay very long at Columbia. I, I will stay just two years maybe, and then uh, I will close the lab, and then I will teach for a couple of years, and then uh, spend my time at the incubator. Um, any interim news on the Alzheimer's study? And we should say, she's not really being fired. It's just being let go because there's no money to pay her. She didn't do anything wrong. Fired implies you did something wrong, right? But she didn't do anything wrong. Is there any interim news on the Alzheimer's study in New York regarding the link to HSV? No, I haven't heard anything yet. So there's an idea that herpes simplex reactivation is related to Alzheimer's and so at least some Alzheimer's. So they're doing a clinical study treating early onset of Alzheimer's. That's not early onset, but people in the early phase of, on, of uh, Alzheimer's with uh, herpes antivirals. And so this is a long study, and I haven't heard anything yet. Pythagoras, how's your theorem going? <laughs> Could low levels of a virus live in our bodies all the time? 
only making us ill if our immune system periodically can't fight off the viruses. Well, Pythagoras, I don't know if you've ever taken a virology course, but you're exactly right. Many viruses are latent in us. So herpes viruses are, all of us have multiple herpes viruses that are quiescent most of the time. From time to time, they begin to reproduce. And, and before the immune system can kick in and tamp them down, which they eventually do, remember there's a memory delay, the uh, herpes has spread to another person. So it is its goal is its evolutionary goal is achieved, and uh, then then the infection stops and you go through that over and over again. That's absolutely true. Thank you, H. Zoo, for your contribution. Why do different respiratory viruses compete with each other? In other words, is it common to get infection from more than one virus at the same time? I think it is very common, and we don't we we don't look at that. Oh, very often, although there are, so the, I don't know if you've heard of the BioFire database, but when you go to a hospital uh, they and you say you have a respiratory problem, they can do what's called a respiratory BioFire panel, which is basically a multiplex PCR, and they look for many, many viruses. You can have a, a CNS multiplex, you can have a gut multiplex, you know, all this these systems, uh, sim, what is it called? Um, It's based on your symptom. Syndromic testing. I say what virus? So you could actually see many different viruses. Many people have multiple viruses in them, but that's not the general population. So the extent to which we have multiple infections isn't clear, but I think it's extensive. I, I don't see why not, right? Many viruses are out there, and there's no reason why you would just get one. Unless, as you say, they compete. And some can, but not all of them, for sure. Amy, if no fourth dose, no cross-reactivity, limited efficacy of pan vaccine, future contraction of T-cells, who's going to save us? Well, um, there is the, the question is how long is the memory going to last, the T-cell memory, right? So, yeah, if it lasts five years, then at that point you might need a, a vaccine. And you can tell by seeing if the severe disease increases. That's what we do for influenza virus. Now, it may also be that in five to ten years, everyone has been infected, and now it's a mild infection in everyone as a consequence, and it becomes like the common cold coronas, which infect everyone every year, cause mild disease. They undergo antigenic variation so that you do get reinfected after you're initially infected. So you get infected every seven years or so, and, and nobody pays attention to them because they're mild. It very well may be that this virus goes that way. We'll see. Ian, thank you for your contribution. Do epitopes have a specific number of amino acids? An epitope is where something binds. Yes, so uh, antibody epitopes will ep are different from T-cell epitopes. So the epitopes to which the T-cell receptor binds or the MHC molecule binds or antibodies bind, they're, they're different sizes. But um, let's see, antibody epitope size, I mean... I usually think five to eight amino acids is what they're saying. So that's the contact point with the, of a antibody with the protein, five to eight amino acids. And polio, they're slightly longer. They're like eight, nine, ten amino acids, but that's it. Okay, so you can make a peptide that contains that, and it will bind to the antibody, yeah. Um, are they predictable? To a certain extent, but I don't think we have all the data we need to be able to predict them. Simple Gardens, thank you for your contribution. Really appreciate it. What are your and Amy's rules for your own protection for being indoors with unvaccinated friends? I don't have any unvaccinated friends. I don't have any unvaccinated family members. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't... Uh, I can count the number of friends I have on one hand. I, I just, and, and I mean, many of them I never see, but they're all vaccinated. And if not, it doesn't matter because I don't see them. And my family's all vaccinated. So I'm at home. I don't wear a mask. The only time I wear a mask is where I have to. Um, in 
subway and on trains at Columbia, but and that I'm usually traveling between one and the other, so I keep the mask on. But if I um, go to a restaurant, I don't wear a mask. I really believe if you have three vaccine doses and you're otherwise healthy, that this is not an issue for you any longer. And so is dropping the masks okay? I think so. What about the immunocompromised? Yeah, they should wear masks. And maybe they need more doses to get an immune response. How long are they going to have to wear masks? That's a great question. They don't want to wear masks forever. Now, the, the upside is if they get infected, you could treat them with monoclonals, so they're not going to have severe disease. You have to catch them early, though, but you can treat them. So all is not lost. So the immunocompromised and also the youngsters below five that are not yet vaccinated, although hopefully at some point they will be vaccinated. You like your mask. You, f you feel invisible. Well, I don't like my mask. The only time I like it is outside in the cold. It keeps your face warm. But at lecturing, I don't like wearing a mask. I don't. I, my glasses fog up. I, I just can't wait to get it off when I get in my car. I don't like it. But I have, I've been wearing it religiously, for sure. Indoors, one hour or so tonight, no mask. Five others all vaxxed. The lady said husband started having sinus back pain last night. If he tests positive and she gets it, what's the chance of spread to us? So, you know, there are people who are spreaders and people who are not spreaders, right? And so if the husband transmits it to the wife, then that the husband is a spreader. And so you have a good chance of getting it, but you're not going to get very sick because you're vaccinated. You're all vaccinated. And this is the way of life going forward. We're going to get infected. We're not going to get very sick. That's the way it works. Not going to do much better than that, no matter what fancy new vaccine we make. My mother's 81. Get her fourth dose ne next week. Not worried. She was a nurse her whole life. She lived to see the good things. No, it's, she'll be fine. Not a problem, fourth dose. And older people want to get fourth doses because their immunity is contracting more rapidly. I don't have a problem with that. But for the general population, no. Have we reached peak vaccinated population? I don't know. So maybe when we have a protein vaccine, which should be shortly given an EUA, Novavax. Maybe some more people will get that because they don't think it's fancy new technology. But I think we have reached the peak. I don't think that vaccine is going to make much of a different difference. Uh, Amy doesn't have a, an email address, but many people find hers. You know, the Columbia address is, is searchable. You can find it. Um, I should give her a microbe TV address, right? <laughs> Last week I gave out her Twitter handle, and then she complained to me that people were hassling her to leave Joe Rogan alone. I said, I'm sorry. I thought it would be fun for you to get in touch with people. <laughs> <laughs> but only the nasties get in touch with her, right? Is our immune system constantly in battle with various, various coronaviruses? Yeah, coronas, rhinoviruses, paramyxoviruses, adenoviruses, metanumoviruses, noroviruses, all kinds, enteroviruses, all the time. And you don't know it because most of the time you're fine. We have a really great immune system when it's working, yeah. I understand endotoxin is nearly impossible to measure due to contamination. How are the biomarkers used to measure endotoxin? I don't know. Does anyone know? How do you measure endotoxin? There are plenty of assays. Yeah, I mean, you can buy them. Many come looking them up. Many Sigma, Fisher, Lanza, um, GeneScript. They all... Uh, Endotoxin is measured in endotoxin units per milliliter. Yeah, it's it's not hard to measure, apparently, Mike. Ooh, that's a bad one. Someone had emptied acetic acid into a waste can 
at the end of the week, I was cleaning it out with bleach. I ended up evolving chlorine. Not good. That's bad. <laughs> if you invent something, you can turn it into Edison after you turn it into salt. Yeah. We don't talk about invention. We develop things. But other people talk about inventing. Yeah, it's fine. I don't care. Is it okay to play Wordle? Um, well, why do you want to play Wordle? Don't you have things to do? Maybe you have an incubation. We'll read something. I think it's probably better. But if it puts your head in a good place, it's fine. It's, you know, people have their own thing. I don't tell people what to do or not do. What's your favorite podcast? This Week in Virology... All the micro TV for podcasts, I think they're the best. I don't listen to pods anymore because I don't drive. I used to drive 72 miles a day, and I used to listen to a lot of pods, and that's how I got into podcasting. But I now take the train, and I love it, and I don't listen to pods anymore. Just my own because I listen to them when I make them and when I edit them. <laughs> I don't play Wordle, no, but it's been brought up on Twib, but I do not play Wordle. I do not play games for the most part. So you may ask, what do I do? I read. I read a lot of papers. And, and so lately, since the pod, uh, since the pandemic started, I haven't had any time to read fiction. But I read a lot of papers, and I don't have a problem with that. I'm okay. I, I edit podcasts. I plan podcasts. Um, I teach. I deal with the company. The Microbe TV needs a lot of dealing with stuff that they'd rather not do but has to be done. So I keep pretty busy, and I don't have time for Wordle. Sorry. Would Yellowstone be off limits to study shared virus of predator and prey? I think that would be a great place. Um, you have to get a permit. You can't harm the wildlife, right? But you, it can be done. People, I know, I know a guy. Um, is it Mark Young? At, I'm not sure where he is, but he once invited me to to bring me into the back places of Yellowstone to see how they sampled and stuff. But we never did it. Maybe after the pandemic, I could do that, and I could film some of it. You know, record some of it. Recent study in Journal of Infection found that immunocompromised kids aren't at risk for severe COVID. I think you said this long ago. Am I wrong? I don't know if you said it, but it really depends on what kind of immunocompromise you're talking about, right? Because I think we did say that, and I think Alessandro Sette on TWIV said that if you don't have antibodies, you actually don't have severe COVID outcomes. And I... I, I um, Suggest you listen to the next TWIV, many of you will, anyway, where uh, they, they, this is where they tested the new intranasal one-dose vaccines with, with three SARS-CoV-2 antigens, and they do some experiments where they deplete T cells and B cells and um, trained innate immune cells from mice. And it doesn't matter if you take out the T or the B, the mice do the same. But if you take out the trained innate cells, then they do poorly. It's very interesting. So the, the immune system is quite redundant. I met vaccinated by a modernist clinical trial and recently experienced a mild COVID. Nobody around me got infected. One data point. <laughs> yes. So last week someone said, I'm, we're, my husband and I are triple vaccinated. And that proves, and, and, um, I gave it to my, I got infected and I gave it to my husband. That proves that vaccinated people can transmit. So, of course, that the one off doesn't prove anything, right? It's not a controlled experiment. Um, but the shedding data indicates, suggests, I would say, that vaccinated people shed less virus for a shorter period of time. So, that has to impact transmission. I agree with you, we don't know for sure. The epidemiology may say otherwise, but I don't think it's a definitive answer because tracing infections is hard. 
And so the lady who said, I infected my husband, how do you know? How do you know where your husband was? You just don't know. You cannot make these conclusions. And I, I think I was a little hard on her, but I'm sorry. And she's not here tonight as a consequence. But I, I think you have to be very careful on making conclusions, first from the press and second from one off. This happened to me. As Daniel Griffin says, the worst n words he wants to hear is, in my experience. <laughs> Have there been any twiv with top biophysicists and biochemists who work on COVID? I don't know. I don't know offhand, but I do know that we we have the developer of Molnupiravir coming up on twiv. As I said in the comments earlier, I I asked Catalin Carico to come on, and and here's what she said: I'm too busy. Okay, no, that's fine. Um. And then I asked Zhang Li Shi, and she said she would do it, except that she f was afraid that her English isn't very good. So I'm, uh, you know, it's too bad. I don't want her to be uncomfortable. So I'm not going to push it. Anyway, so I'm sorry, real Koalia. I don't remember so many of the past guests. I'm sure there have been. I'm not sure about biophysicists, but certainly biochemists. Shingles vaccine, how long to space from the COVID booster? I would say 90 days <clears throat> would be a good time. Media doesn't understand that infection does not mean disease. No, they don't. They, they conflate it. And they don't understand that antibodies and T-cells contract after vaccination or infection. And they pick these, these deadly headlines of vaccines are failing. We need more boosters. This is a disservice to humanity, folks. I don't read the, the news anymore. I get my information from other scientists, at least about science. Have you seen that in Denmark and Norway where BA2 took, took over, uh, cases didn't fall? I think BA2 is, is immune evasive even more so than Omicron. Um, not more transmissible, immune evasive, and that's why it, it drives very quickly through a population. What's the link between herpes and Alzheimer's? As I said, there's, there's a postulated link. And so a trial is being done for anti-herpes virus drugs treating Alzheimer's. We don't know the outcome yet. It's a long-term study. Watching you guys makes me think of let's make America smart again. Is that what he said? That's a great saying. I love it. It's a long-term study, but that's what we're trying to do here. And, and, you know, the things we do with our pods, nobody does this. Nobody does the science that we do. And I'm proud of it. I love teaching. I teach extensively every semester. I do lots of pods. I do writing and so forth. Uh, and the more I can do, the better. I, I just love to teach people, as I've said many times here. Can you comment on the level of vaccinated people in the U.S.? Yeah, that's right. Only 63-something percent are fully two-dose vaccinated, and only 30 percent have had a, uh, a third dose, right? So um, that's not good. Let's look it up just to be sure with my clicky keyboard, the vaccine tracker. No, I don't want that. I want the, the numbers, folks. Fully vaccinated, that's two vaccines. And it also breaks down by age groups, right? So yeah, you're right, 30%, 28% are boosted. 64% fully vaccinated, that's two doses, and 76% have one dose. And I don't know what the percentage is infected. You know, that's kind of a um, squishy uh, target there. We don't really know how to calculate that properly. Was the preprint that posited SARS-CoV-2 as retrovirus positive been drawn? 
Well, there, there were actually, I don't know exactly what you mean, but there were preprints that were published that said that the uh, the RNA was integrated into cell DNA, and they've been, they've been published. They were peer-reviewed and published. Not very well peer-reviewed because I think they're irrelevant. Does the Danish study on Omicron indicate that people who receive vaccine boosters are more likely to be infected than those who do not? No, they're not, no. They, it, they, what they did, that's not correct. What they did is they said the boosters had a bigger effect on Delta compared to Omicron. So Delta, which doesn't immunivate as well as Omicron does, is more impacted by a booster. And the, the booster effect on Omicron is less. And that's why they conclude its spread in the population is due to immune evasion. Can I please play some Led Zeppelin on, on that guitar there? I haven't p picked up that guitar in probably 10 years. Oh, actually, I moved it two years ago when I started recording down here in my basement. I haven't played it in a long time. Boy, I would love to, but no time for that right now when we ease up a bit. Yeah, but not now. But I would love to. Yes, I will do it one day. I did promise people before I would do that. Yep. People's respect and awareness of your field has been positive. Yes, to a certain extent. But do you know that a certain number of people don't have no have no respect for expertise, right? The death of expertise. And this makes me very sad because I don't display my expertise to be arrogant or to say I'm better than you. I ex display it to try and explain something to you. Yet people become, certain people, not everyone, and certainly not people here tonight, become suspicious. And they say, you know, I don't care that you know all this. I know more or something like that. So it's really unfortunate. By the way, there have been uh, 850 of you here tonight. That's great. Now it's down to 740, but only 353 likes. So if you could take a moment and hit the like button, which is just below the video window, I would appreciate it. It just makes, it doesn't make us money. It just makes this more visible to other people so they can learn as well. Who is the greatest living virologist? <laughs> that is just impossible to say. And I would insult too many people. Um, I, don't, I don't by any means think I am, for sure not. No. Nope. Um, I... There's some candidates, but I don't, as I said, I don't, we could, if, if you met me for a drink somewhere one day, we could talk about it at the bar, but, or over coffee, but I don't want to do it here. Well, made me change your mind about the booster because a study out of uh, Ontario came out a number of months ago, which we covered on TWIV, that said the booster corrects the too close spacing of the first doses. So, in particular, you know, antibodies from people with two doses given three to four weeks apart had a, had trouble neutralizing Omicron. But if you gave a third dose six months later, you now made antibodies that could neutralize Omicron as well as other SARS coronavi uh, coronaviruses like uh, SARS-1 and MERS coronaviruses. So that convinced me. But that's just an antibody response. There's no information about disease. So just because Omicron is not neutralized by the two closely spaced doses vaccine schedule doesn't mean you're going to get sicker. And Paul Offit is on record saying he still doesn't think it's needed. But I thought that was good incentive. So I said to Amy, let's get it. And then the next day, Columbia made it mandatory to have a booster. So I would have had to do it anyway. But that's what I did. I thought that was good information. But I did... I did not think the justification before that was appropriate. And the justification here in the U.S. was the antibody levels are contracting, which is normal. Um, and we're afraid that severe disease is going to go up. So we think we should give you a booster. But there was no evidence that severe disease was rising. You know, so I didn't buy that. And then when it turned out that it's the fixed too close spacing, that made it clear to me. 
So if you get two doses six months apart, you're perfect. However, waiting six months after one dose puts you at greater risk for infection. So the it's going to be a three-dose vaccine because you get two quick ones in, so you're protected, and then a third one later to really give you the broad antibody and maybe T-cell response as well. Here's another great question. Who was the most overlooked virologist in history? And um, I'd have to think about that a long time. Um, there are many who got lots of credit. I would say that Peyton Rouse was overlooked for many years, but then finally got recognition. It took 50 years for the Nobel Committee to recognize that he had uh, discovered a virus that caused cancer in 1911, and so he got the Nobel Prize in 1965. So he was overlooked for a long time, but there are many others as well. There's more than one. So I would say there's not just the greatest, but there are many. My wife has COVID, had lunch with her friend who had COVID less than 60 days ago and reinfected her friend. She tested positive twice in the last two months. How is that possible? I, I think there's too much uh, imprecise information here, Tony. Um, I'm not sure about these reinfections. However... And I don't know what the vaccination status, so I don't want to venture because I'm not sure of the question and all the information. <laughs> Will soaking feet in vinegar help get rid of fungusy toenails? I have no idea. Any pedicurists here tonight? I'm not sure. Or, or podiatrists, I guess. That would be better. Thank you, Kent, for your contribution. Really appreciate your support of the incubator. Many studies have found that cytokine storm, for whatever reason, rises risk of autism in offspring of various women with serious infections like COVID. Is this a reason for a vaccinated pregnant woman to wear masks? I don't know. I'm not familiar with those studies, Hans. Um, in, inflammation during pregnancy is not a good thing. That's certainly the case. But I am not certain of the connection with autism. That's a very difficult one. Um, but I, I think, you know, pregnancy does immunosuppress you. So it's not a bad, even if you're vaccinated, it's not a bad idea to wear a mask because your response is going to be somewhat muted because of the pregnancy, right? A gallbladder eight? No, CFR, I can show you CFR that is less than flu. It depends where you look at it. So don't say come on V. I know what I'm talking about. You're wrong. I don't get any pleasure of saying you're wrong, but you're not thinking because you haven't seen all the data. Early in the outbreak in China, CFR in Wuhan was huge, and in the rest of China, it was low. How do you explain that? It's the same virus. So you can't compare COVID with flu. It depends what year flu you're talking about. This is the problem with people who don't look at the data. Vinegar. We're talking about vinegar. <laughs> and also, don't tell me I didn't read something. How the hell do you know I didn't read it? Keep the personal comments out of it. Are they looking for viruses on the moon or Mars? Well, there is, um, you know, the problem is you bring stuff there, right? This, there's, no, there's no life on the moon, and whatever's there is brought from Earth, like, like microbes. So, yeah, they're probably viruses of the microbes, but they're, once they're there, they're not going to live because there's nothing for them to live off, right? Although, you know, you, know, you shouldn't put it away from bacteria, but these are bacteria from cushy Earth, Um and Mars, yeah, they will certainly look for microbial life. And uh, if they're smart, they'll look for viruses. But I'm not aware of them. 
I'm not aware of them. All else equal. Am I, am I boosted three months ago, never infected, likely to have a shorter shedding window than my relations who are infected and recovered but never vaccinated? <laughs> you asked this question of Amy weeks ago, or someone asked the same question, for sure. So um, I think the... Um, the three vaccine is better than recovered with no vaccine in terms of reducing the shedding period. That's what the data say. Yeah. Do you think that the Delta Omicron variant spike this summer, I live in the mountains of Kentucky. Is there going to be a spike this summer? Is that what you're asking? Yes, there will be for sure. I hope I'm wrong. Um, they're, because people hang out in the summer, the students travel and so forth, there'll be a spike. There are plenty of unimmunized, uninfected people, yeah. Are there mitochondria viruses? Yeah. You know what they're called? Mitoviruses. And they probably came from the bacteria that, were, that invaded cells to become mitochondria many, many, many years ago. Remember that? Yeah, and, and we have the question, how could viruses exist before cells of viruses are obligate intracellular parasites? That's a good question. It shows that you are listening. So th there were certainly self-replicating nucleic acids before cells. Uh, so they were precursors to viruses, precursors to cells too. So they weren't viruses technically, but I would say that they were the ancestors of viruses. I think the defining feature of a virus is a capsid of some kind, either a membrane or a protein shell. So these were not, these were not um, viruses. People are fading, huh? As a trucker, I listen to Twiv, Twip, and Twim. Wow, good for you. Glad to hear it. Not music, right? Thank you for your contribution, Riri Med. Will mRNA technology stop future pandemics? Well, it didn't stop this one, right? It's limiting it. It's it's eventually going to stop it. Okay. Yeah, I think so. But the question is, how long does it have to go before we stop, right? Does it going to take a year to develop the mRNA? Or are we going to be ready? It would be better if we're ready, right? But I think coronavirus pandemics, we know that mRNA technology works. Whether it works for influenza, we have to find out. And those are the two big ones in terms of pandemics. I think that's it. My fiance got vaccinated with J&J a month before becoming pregnant, then got a Pfizer booster eight months later in her third trimester. Would our baby have antibodies? Yeah, she'll, the, the baby will have some. It's. It, I think the, it's best to uh, do it in the second to third to give you optimum transfer over the placenta. Study, I think a study we uh, did um, on TWIV a while ago showed that there was an optimum time to, to get vaccinated, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, your baby's going to get antibodies uh, either way for sure. Thank you, Callista. Hey, Callista, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, thanks for your contribution to the incubator. I like how feisty Amy is and Vincent isn't delicate. No, I'm not delicate, that's for sure. Never been. <laughs> Why are viroids only found in angiosperms? I think that, uh, the, you know, viroids are naked RNA molecules, and I think they're best transmitted through plants and among plants. Um, you know, they're, they're transmitted in seeds a lot, so that's good to uh, protect the RNA. Uh, and, the, well, you know, the, the structure of plant cells and that there's an open fluid transmission among all of them helps them as well. That's what I think, but I don't really know what the answer is, right? It's so funny how many of you are looking at this on the big screen. That's cool. I'm here in the basement with a little 27-inch monitor. 80-inch. Whoa. Okay, we got up to 500 uh, likes. That's good. Thank you very much. 
cardiologist playing virologist is schwag to whoever equals dank in herb um, herb nomenclature that's very funny all right i'm going to try and start wrapping up here because i know a lot of you have been around amy has just left in the comments um You say remove the mask mandate. Are you at all afraid of getting asymptomatic long COVID? No, because three vaccines, uh, long COVID is practically non-existent. Not at all. Can you say more regarding the Columbia mask mandate? Columbia student here. I'm curious about why we believe we don't need a mask. Well, Carolina, you should take my virology course, first of all. Why don't you? Secondly, we're all vaccinated, and we're all probably triple vaccinated. Why do you need a mask? What's the mask doing? You're not immunocompromised. You're, as far as you know, if you are immunocompromised, you can wear a mask. You're not only ni over 90 years old or over 80 years old. So there's no need to – we have vaccines that work. It's time to get back to life. This virus is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And so you either wear a mask forever or take it off now. Thank you, Detebio, for your contribution. What does viral load mean? Does it affect the amount of virus that can be transmitted to others? Does length of time around the infected impact this? Okay, so viral load is, is a catch-all term for how much virus you have in your nose or wherever it is that you're measuring. You can measure it by infectivity, which is the best way and which hardly anyone does because it's hard. And, you know, that's not an excuse, folks. If something's hard, don't tell me you can't do it because it's hard because uh, a lot of people do hard things. Or you can measure it by PCR, which is too sensitive and doesn't measure infectious virus. It measures all kinds of pieces of RNA that are not infectious. So, yeah, if you're shedding a lot of virus in respiratory droplets, you're more likely to infect others. I think that's a big determinant of super spreading events. I think when you're vaccinated, you shed less virus, although no one has looked at infectious virus except the Swiss study, which is not yet out in a journal, but it's very good. Um, and that's why I think vaccinated people are going to transmit much less. They shed less for a shorter period of time. And so, yes, the length of time around uh, other people impacts it because you're constantly exhaling virus. And the longer they're there, the more likely they are to inhale enough to get infected, for sure. Uh, we are placing all of their eggs in the vaccine basket. What else do you want us to do? We have vaccines that work. I think that you're making an unreasonable position there. And the vaccinated have far less long COVID. And yes, I do not not care about the unvaccinated, but I offered them vaccines and they said no. It's their choice. Don't put it on me. Can experts be sure that future variants won't be more pathogenic? None of them have been more pathogenic as far as I can see. I look at the data. There are no good data that they're more pathogenic, yet people say it all the time. It's really unfortunate. You know, they said, oh, Omicron is less virulent. It is not. Oh, it's it's less virulent than hamsters. Really? Are we hamsters? In people, it still kills people. Daniel Griffin sees people in the hospital all the time. They're unvaccinated. They have Omicron. You know, will it become more pathogenic? I doubt it. We never see virus. There's no selection for becoming more pathogenic. It could accidentally as a consequence of something else, but I think it's pretty unlikely. I've never seen it happen. I've been looking at viruses for a long time. I care about all humans, but if you make a choice, then you're putting your fate in your own hands. If you decide not to become unvaccinated, which is an unreasonable choice, but it's your choice, you're putting your fate in your own hands. It's not that I don't care about you, but you can't influence the rest of, of society by that choice. Okay, let's... Um T detect test detects T cells. It's not it's not quantitative. It just says yes or no. It's not really useful information. Yeah. 
Subclinical is a very good word. Thank you, gallbladder eight. Yes, that's better. A subclinical infection. And so, oh, I just realized the person who said asymptomatic disease is a oxymoron. That's not what we call it. We call it an asymptomatic infection or a subclinical infection. All right, we have resolution now. We can go to sleep feeling confident that we have resolved this issue. <laughs> Uh, so anything that Malone says is wrong. He's got an agenda to make lots of money, and the spike doesn't last longer than previously thought, and it doesn't mean anything. I, I'm sorry, but he's really a nasty person by, for what he is doing. Being hillbilly has its advantages and disadvantages. Your show gives me a lot of information to share with my community. My hope is we could save one life at a time, and I have with you all's help. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And I, that's what I want to do. I want to help people. Not get in arguments with people who say, I don't read, or come on, Vincent. That's not why I'm here. I think of things carefully, and I do make mistakes, but I'm not here to deal with that, I'm here to teach you guys. Hayden, thank you so much. 120 inch. Oh, my God. I can't imagine what I look like at 120 inches. Thank you, Robert, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. This all goes to support the incubator. I'm going to wrap up now because our good mods are here for a long time. A lot of great questions. Appreciate them. Thank you, Kat, for your uh, contribution to the incubator. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Terrace. Here we go. Tesseract, the, the four-dimensional cube. Thank you. Can you send me papers that compare vaccine plus booster plus vaccine plus infection? I need it in a few days. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you have my mail since last week. I'm sorry. You know how many emails I get a day? I can't even go through them all. Um, I will try and get it, Tesseract, but I have it ton of stuff to do. Why aren't we pushing for vaccinating third world countries? Not my, not, it's not my purview at all. I, I agree with you 100% though. I wish we would do more of it. And I tell people, oh, we are, we are. But it's not enough, obviously. All right, let's get through the, the thanks and then we'll wrap this up. Callista, another contribution. Thank you. Are migraines associated with long COVID? Yes, it's one of the signs. Yes, uh, symptoms, symptoms. It's what you feel. Thank you, Doreen, for your contribution. I don't need the Super Bowl. This is my weekly Super Beaker. I didn't watch the Super Bowl at all. I don't think it's... Uh, you know what my philosophy has always been? I want to learn from people. I don't want to be entertained. I want to make my own entertainment. Thank you, Carmen, for your contribution. It is kind of a journal club, right? Yellowstone is where TAC came from. That's right. One of those amazing, amazing uh, findings. Just random stuff. Curiosity. You bet. Thank you, Brent, for your contribution. Appreciate it. Has there been further study into Spike reaching the nucleus and interrupting DNA? All of that was wrong. No further need to because it was wrong to begin with. Thank you, German opera singer. If memory cells last less than 10 years, why would there not be a resurgence of severe COVID outbreaks every decade? Yeah, because by then we'll be all exposed. There won't be any older people who are the most at risk, and everyone will be exposed in every year we're going to get exposed by whatever is circulating. So we're going to get boosted naturally. We're not going to need the vaccine to do that. Thank you, Roman, for your contribution. Thank you, Michael, for your contribution. I assume Michael is in Mexico, MX. Take care. Uh, and I want to thank the mods for tonight. Um, Vanity Nutrition, Frank, Tom, Les, and Steph. Thank you for your um, thank you for your it's never reasonable to assume that I didn't read. AM Rosa, 
sorry, as you're being insulting. Um, uh, the mods do a great job of tamping down the riffraff here. Appreciate it. And you can go ahead and give me a thumbs down, AM Rosa 10. Go ahead. I think it's nasty to say I didn't read. I read far more than most people, but not as much as Amy. Thank you, Dr. Tonya, for your contribution. Really appreciate it for the um, contribution to the incubator. So that does it for another Q&A with A and V. A couple of people got me prickly here at the end. I'm sorry to not insinuate that I haven't read or I don't understand something. That is the bane of my existence because what I do is to try and understand things. And that's what I say. I'm not always right, but don't insinuate. Anyway, those of you that didn't get your questions answered, um, please come back next week. If you didn't like your answer, you can come back next week and try again. In the meantime, stay safe uh, and uh, be curious. Be curious all the time. Good night, folks, and thank you.